Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. It is so wonderful to see all of you here in Kimmel Theater. There are so many of you that I have to turn around in a constitutional arc to take in the full range of this wonderful audience here to talk about one of the most important questions facing American democracy, the future of political gerrymandering. We are here to discuss this fascinating and long-standing political practice which was championed by a man who now all of us who are here tonight know can pronounce Elbridge Gerry rather than Elbridge Jerry. Up in Signers Hall you can see a statue of Elbridge Gerry, the Massachusetts politician who created the gerrymander or gerrymander. And thanks to our wonderful host and sponsor, John Aguilora, we all have these incredibly uh, cool and striking postcards which show what the original gerrymander or gerrymander looked like. It was so serpentine in Massachusetts that it snuck around and was shaped like a salamander. And that's why it's called a gerrymander. And even today that Massachusetts district exists and continues to delight and discomfit uh, partisans of all stripes. Uh, before we get going, I want us all to remind ourselves of the mission of the National Constitution Center. I see here there are some members who are going to be able to recite the mantra along with me. We have some new friends who will be hearing it for the first time. And it comes from our beautiful congressional charter. This is a private nonprofit, not a government institution, but it was created by Congress during the bicentennial of the Constitution with an inspiring mission. Here we go to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Isn't that beautiful, especially given our topic tonight? And then there's a second clause of that sentence, in order to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. And that's what this beautiful institution does. It brings together the finest thinkers in America, liberal, conservative, libertarian, to debate not political issues, but constitutional issues, and to converge around this beautiful document of human freedom which unites us the U.S. Constitution. We are a membership organization. Those of you who are members, we're so happy that you're part of our family. Those who are not, if you love our program tonight, as I hope that you will, please join the National Constitution Center. Get all of our wonderful content, the emails, the blogs, the programs, the interactive Constitution, so that you can educate yourself about the Constitution and be a full citizen. And now it is my great pleasure to uh, thank the sponsor of tonight's event, John Aguilera. John is a patriot who thinks it's really important to bring together the top thinkers in the country to debate issues ranging from term limits to whether we should have a constitutional convention to gerrymandering, and he has made this program possible, and it's now my great pleasure to thank and welcome John Aguilera. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, and welcome, folks. Uh, thanks for taking the time out of your schedule, especially a December one, to come here tonight on, I think, a very important issue. Uh, you all got the cards. Uh, by the way, uh, <clears throat> am I too loud? So, in any event, he lost. So, Governor Jerry, who did this gerrymandering, lost the election. The ha his house won in 1812. The house and the Senate, but not him. Uh, you've probably seen Philadelphia Inquirer in the last 30 days or so, gerrymandering has uh, become just a very popular uh, you know, hit song in our political world. And uh, so we, uh, it's, we're gonna have a good time. Excellent scholars. Uh, I talked to them this evening. We had a short dinner, two of, of, of which I disagree with, okay? Uh, but the other two are very good, so you'll figure it out. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so in politics, setting these statewide electoral districts is the practice of establishing political uh, advantage of one party over the other in manipulating boundaries in any given district. Both major parties have been guilty of fostering this process for the sake of partisan gain. The name given is gerrymandering. Um, 
in these newspaper articles, it, I think it, it, it provides a 360-degree angle. Um, you know, for, for some of you Catholics out there, it's, some, it's a mortal sin. Others think it's not so much a, a, maybe a, a hard sin or maybe even not so much a sin at all. It's just part of the nature of politics. So we'll discuss that today with these very learned panel. Um, the, the two taxi, tactics have been used in diluting and concentrating the political districts to affect voting outcomes. Uh, these demographics are ethnicity, uh, linguistic, religious, um, and uh, the, the, the most are utilized tools to protect or eliminate incumbents. And let's face it, incumbency is an issue in itself. Uh, it's uh, 90 and 90 percent plus a congressional incumbency. There's a lot of reasons for that. It, it, it seems to me a piece of that a, a high rate of incumbency would be because of gerrymandering. Uh, in 2012, I think uh, a number of examples show how this partisan gerrymandering can adversely affect elections right here in Pennsylvania. Um, Democratic election uh, candidates in the House received 83,000 more votes than the Republican candidates. Democrats, 83,000 more than Republicans. Um, and uh, yet the Republican controlled redistricting process from, nine, from 2010. Uh, Ed Gillespie, the governor, he lost the, the, the governorship, but he is like behind from half a dozen years ago or so this uh, using technology to uh, affect uh, what happened. So the Democrats uh, in Pennsylvania w wound up losing to the Republican counterparts in 13 out of 18 districts. Technology, again, uh, made gerrymandering much more effective. Amazing precision. Uh, the constitutional uh, amendment uh, is an issue uh, that's been thought of to, uh, you know, would knock out, uh, out of existence, uh, gerrymandering. But that's a big lift, constitutional amendment. Uh, Supreme Court has been more active over the years. It's come up, but it's, it's much more uh, uh, active now. And the Supreme Court, of course, would determine whether partisan gerrymandering itself uh, is unconstitutional. So, um, I think uh, now more than ever, uh, this issue is being discussed, and we've got a great panel. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, John. So grateful to you and uh, your wonderful wife, Joan Carter, for supporting this, and the spirit of bipartisanship with which you've sponsored these debates is very welcome indeed. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're in for an incredible constitutional treat here because you are about to hear two of America's leading advocates and scholars about gerrymandering, both of whom are at the center of this debate. So Aaron Murphy, uh, who uh, is a partner at the Washington firm of Kirkland & Ellis, argued the Gill case that the Supreme Court heard at the end of October, which could determine the future of partisan gerrymandering. So you're gonna hear from her a firsthand account of what it's like to argue before the Supreme Court and how she evaluates the issues. And Nick Stephanopoulos, professor of law at the University of Chicago, came up with the mathematical measurement called the efficiency gap that is being presented to the court as the best way of evaluating what an extreme partisan gerrymander is. So you could not have two people better on both sides to begin our discussion of the constitutional aspects of this case. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Aaron Murphy and Nicholas Stephanopoulos. Welcome. Please. Aaron, we have to start in by just asking what it felt like to argue before the court. I know the audience will just want you to describe the experience. You know what? So let me just start with that. What did it feel like to argue before the Supreme Court? <laughs> sure. Well, first, thank you so much for inviting me here for this wonderful event. It's very it's great to see so many people excited about the Constitution. Uh, I basically, you know, spend a lot of my time doing constitutional law, so uh, I love love seeing people who like to do it for fun. Uh, it, it, 
arguing before the Supreme Court is, it, you know, it, it's an extraordinary experience. I mean, it's, it's just like nothing else in practice. I, you know, I mean, there's wonderful other courts out there, but there's something about being there, and particularly for a big argument like this, where you know there's so much kind of public scrutiny and excitement about it. There's just an energy that you get at the court from the people who are there uh, to, to, to see the argument and from the justices. For a case like this, they tend to have a lot more questions than, say, you know, your average bankruptcy case or whatever it may be. Uh, so, so you certainly get a different energy from the justices too. And I mean, it's uh, obviously a very nerve wracking experience. I, I certainly won't say that uh, I, I'm not extraordinarily nervous when I get up there, but it's such a dialogue that uh, you know, they, they ask you questions and you, for me, once they start asking questions, I kind of, uh, come as close as you can while still standing before the Supreme Court of the United States to sort of forgetting where I am and what I'm doing and just get very engaged in that back and forth. That's the most, the mark of a successful argument, which you absolutely have, is that feeling of an intimate conversation where you forget about the audience entirely and you're just looking at the justices and responding to them. All right, let's jump right in. And I want to begin by identifying what the justices might view as the constitutional harm of partisan gerrymandering. And they focused on the First Amendment rights of association. And Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor asked you some very direct questions. Justice Ginsburg says, I'd like you to, to ask you what's really behind all this, the precious right to vote. If you can stack a legislature in this way, what incentive is there for a voter to exercise his right to vote. So tell the audience uh, how you understood her to be articulating the harm and what your response was. Sure. So, you know, there, there's really kind of two different theories that have been articulated over the years as to how you think about the harm if there is a constitutionally cognizable harm involved in partisan gerrymandering. And for a long time, it had been thought of mostly as a potential 14th Amendment injury in the form probably of an equal protection violation and saying that it's in class-based discrimination against a, uh, a particular uh, person or political party on, on the basis of their politics. And probably, uh, I think it's about a, a decade ago, Justice Kennedy authored an opinion, uh, a concurring opinion in a case that rejected partisan gerrymandering claims but left open the door for the possibility of bringing future ones. Um, he, he posited that he thought that maybe the better way to think about the potential injury here is a First Amendment violation and the idea that you're retaliating against somebody for their political beliefs. And from my own perspective, I think that, that the challenge, whether you come at it from a 14th Amendment lens or a First Amendment lens, is that you still have to tie it to a representational injury, uh, some sort of injury that affects, you know, in, in my view, it needs to be an injury that affects your vote, your, the, the value of your vote, the ability of your vote, or your own personal representation. Um, and, and I think, you know, and, and when you read some of the justices, there's certainly a lot of disagreement about this, uh, but when you read uh, uh, several of the justices' opinions who are of the view that they're a little wary of the idea that there is a constitutional injury here, what they're wary about is whether the injuries that are being articulated really tie back to a personalized interest in you know, this affecting my vote as opposed to a more generalized interest in I don't love the way that the votes writ large throughout the state are stacking up in terms of representation. That's a very helpful distinction. So Nick, before we turn to the efficiency gap, I wanna dig in on this question of identifying the constitutional harm. Aaron says that Justice Kennedy conceives of the First Amendment as protecting a right of voters to associate with those whose views are compatible uh, with theirs. Um, that's what he said in the Vieth case that she referred to. Um, and to allow the legislature to reflect the people's will and that it might be a violation of that right for legislatures to retaliate against voters in a way that made it harder for legislatures to reflect the people's will. That, that still seems a little abstract to me. Is, have I stated it right, or can you more precisely state how Justice Kennedy conceives of the First Amendment harm of partisan gerrymandering? Uh, so there, well, thanks again for, for having us both here. This is really terrific. Uh, 
there's, there's a few different strands that are running through Justice Kennedy's reasoning in, in Vieth and in other cases. Uh, one of those strands would be that the government simply is prohibited from taking retaliatory action against a single voter or against a group of voters because of those voters' political beliefs. Uh, and so on that reasoning, uh, the, the core problem with partisan gerrymandering is that you have the state uh, taking adverse action, you know, drawing district lines in such a way that a particular group of voters uh, suffer a representational harm. And the state is taking that action precisely because this group of voters, uh, they're, they're Democrats or they're Republicans, and they're the opposite party from those who are drawing the district lines. So the, the core of the violation is adverse state action taken against a particular group of voters on account of the ideology or the political viewpoints uh, of those voters. Um, and you mentioned the, uh, the harm of the legislature either reflecting or not reflecting the will of the voters. Um, that's really what's at stake here. So you know, what is the, the ultimate harm to a group of voters who are the victim of partisan gerrymandering, it's that their collective representation in the legislature or in Congress is undermined. Uh, you have a legislative body that simply does not reflect the will, the preferences of the people. Uh, you have a legislative body that will then uh, enact policies that do not reflect what the people want. And uh, that mismatch between voters' actual preferences and the output of their government, I think that's the core injury of partisan gerrymandering. Great, so Aaron, uh, Nick just stated the injury uh, uh, very clearly. Uh, legisl uh, legislatures that don't reflect the will of the people and situations where a party can win a minority of the votes but get a majority of the seats, as happened in Wisconsin where Republicans won 48% of the votes but got 66 out of 99 seats. During the arguments, Justice Gorsuch asked someone, I think it wasn't you, whether that sounded more like a violation of the Republican form of government clause, which requires uh, the federal government to prevent states from undermining democracy and ensuring majority rule. What's your response to Nick's suggestion that uh, there's a constitutional problem when a party can win a minority of the votes but get a majority of the seats? Well, I, I mean, I think the, the bare notion that you know, winning a majority of the seats without a majority of the votes is itself undemocratic is, is, is fundamentally inconsistent with our representational system of having you know, single member districting elections. I mean, it's just inherent in that kind of system, and the court has recognized this repeatedly, that it, you can have that outcome for perfectly permissible reasons. I mean, if you think about just if, if all the districts were drawn in a way where you were trying to get them to be very, very close elections, and then you ended up with one party, you know, getting across every district 49% of the vote and the other one getting 51% of the vote across the district. I mean, you'd end up with all of the districts going to one party, even though it only got 51% of the vote, but that might have absolutely nothing to do with gerrymandering. It's just the product of winner-take-all elections. So I think you have to go beyond that to start identifying anything that could be a constitutionally cognizable in injury. Because otherwise, you know, and this was basically one of the things Justice Gorsuch and a couple other justices were getting at, you're, you're putting into the Constitution a right to proportional representation. And you know, there, there may be nothing wrong in the abstract with the theory of proportional representation being a good representational scheme, but it's not ours. And you, know, you can't kind of write that into the Constitution when it is not only not the system we have, but the Constitution pretty expressly contemplates that you know, it, it shouldn't be the system we have, and it's really never been the system we have. So I, I think one of the difficulties in this area is that there, there's a natural instinct to think that something seems a little unfair if you didn't get a majority of the seats when you got a majority of the votes. But I think you have to look beneath the surface of that to really ask, well, is that, is that actually a problem or is it just an instinct that I have to look a little bit more and explain and understand why it happened? Great. So, Nick, what's your response to that powerful point that came up in the oral argument? Chief Justice Roberts said, you're really asking for a right of proportional representation, and this court has never required that in the racial districting cases or the partisan uh, cases. And Aaron says that in a winner-take-all system, 
there's no objective standard short of proportional representation for identifying unfairness, and therefore any standard, even your great efficiency gap standard, which I'll ask you to explain in a second, is basically just made up by judges. So what's the response? Yeah, so proportional representation is not some general vague term that we have to fight over what it means. Uh, it has a specific, clear, universally agreed upon definition. Uh, and that is a share of seats for a party that is equal to that party's proportion of the vote. So you have proportional representation when a party, for example, gets 57% of the vote and 57% of the seats. Uh, you have proportionality if a party gets 25% of the vote and 25% of the seats. You know, that is the definition of proportional representation. Uh, once we're clear on the definition, none of the metrics that we argued for in, uh, in Whitford have anything to do with proportional representation. Uh, none of the metrics would ever require uh, a party's seat share to be equal to a party's vote share. Um, and that is very much by design, because Aaron is right that with a system of winner-take-all single-member districts, uh, you can't expect that system to produce pure proportionality. Uh, there's a, a well-known feature for the American system uh, called the winner's bonus, where uh, you expect the majority party uh, the party winning more than 50% of the vote, to win an even larger, you know, disproportionately large share of the seats in the legislature. So, you know, proportional representation is fundamentally inconsistent with the American electoral system. Uh, but we know from thousands and thousands of elections how large the winner's bonus tends to be in American elections. And the efficiency gap that you mentioned uh, corresponds perfectly to the observed historical winner's bonus in American elections. Uh, so these metrics are not imposing some, you know, European uh, system on American elections. Uh, all they're trying to do is have American elections live up to their own historic uh, behavior. Uh, you know, an efficiency gap of zero means that a map treats the parties symmetrically and fairly, and it means that we don't see proportional representation. Rather, it means we see exactly the degree of disproportionate representation that we've always seen in American elections. Uh, and so that's why you know, none of these metrics uh, amount to, to PR. You know, they're, they're designed to not be equivalent to PR. Uh, great. So, Aaron, uh, uh, Justice Sotomayor asked you a question that I'll uh, read. She says... I didn't know I was going to have to re-argue the case. Well, but. Yeah. <laughs> you did very well the first time, so I just want to <laughs> share the love with, uh, with, with, our, with our friends. She said, um, I don't understand what that means. I mean, it's okay, to attack, it's okay to stack the decks so that for 10 years or an indefinite period of time, one party, even though it gets a minority of votes, uh, can get a majority of the seats. And that idea of stacking the decks so that you can determine... Uh, 10 years forward, which party is going to win came up in the opening argument of uh, Paul Smith as well. Is that sort of stack the deck argument so minorities can rule for long periods of time uh, an alternative to proportional representation as, a, as, the, as the injury that's being discussed? Well, it's certainly a theory. I mean, it's, it's largely the theory of the district court, the court below that ruled in favor of the challengers to Wisconsin's plan went on a theory of kind of this is the, the decks have been stacked for a long time here, so we think that's enough to, to show this. But you know, I think that really gets at what our fundamental objection in, in the case is, is less to the idea that like there's something good about stacking the decks um, and more to the notion of, well, how are you how are you figuring that out? What is it, you know, is there really a reliable way to tell whether the decks have actually been stacked? And, you know, I mean, there, there's certainly a lot of ideas and new theories and new metrics that have been proposed in this case. And I, 
I, I, I totally agree with think that they are not straight proportional representation theories. It's a different theory that's based on, uh, you know, measuring the kind of, uh, as, as I think is a fair way to put it, you know, do the parties have an equal opportunity to translate their votes, their kind of statewide vote totals into statewide seat totals? Does the same, roughly the same number of votes get you to the roughly the same number of seats? And, you know, in, in, in the abstract, maybe that, that is a good way to think about the problem, but the the problem is the metrics, you know, have have proven to to not be all that reliable. And I think one of the best illustrations of that is, I mean, when when you take the efficiency gap metrics and you apply them to define kind of the worst worst gerrymandered maps in the country in the past 30 or 40 years. I mean, 10 of them, 10 of the 17 that were identified were not drawn by legislatures at all. They were drawn by courts or independent districting commissions, entities that were not at all trying to operate through a political lens. So that all has to beg the question of, well, even accepting the premise that, you know, if we could measure when the decks have been stacked, then we'd have a constitutional injury to talk about. You still have to go back to the question of, but can we measure reliably when the decks have been stacked? Excellent. So now, uh, friends, we come to the second question. How do you measure the injury? How do you measure if the decks have been stacked? And just to review, and I'm doing this for myself as much as for you, because this is a complicated question. We've heard at least two theories of what the constitutional violation is. One is it's this First Amendment expressive injury where legislatures intentionally discriminate against voters to prevent a majority of voters from winning a majority of the seats. And the second is this idea of party entrenchment, where you're stacking the decks to ensure that one party will rule for a long time uh, in a way that is unfair too. But then the question is, how do you measure unfairness? How do you measure partisan entrenchment? And how do you measure the First Amendment vi violation? And much of the argument before the Supreme Court took place on that precise question. Nick, you are the author, the inventor, the, the, the Thomas Edison of the efficiency gap formula, which the district court in Wisconsin adopted in identifying uh, an unconstitutional gerrymander. And uh, the majority summarized its standard for judging partisanship as a three-step approach. First, they see if there was a specific aim to place a severe impediment on the effectiveness of the votes. Second, the question is whether that maps did have that effect. And third, whether the effect can be justified on the basis of a le legitimate legislative grounds. And in measuring whether the effect was unfair, they adopted your efficiency gap formula. So please, uh, f first of all, congratulations for being such a central part of the case. Explain to our colleagues and uh, friends what the efficiency gap formula is and how it measures on constitutional gerrymanders. Uh, sure. Before I do that, let me just note a couple of important caveats. Uh, one is that the efficiency gap is just a member of a family of related metrics of partisan unfairness or partisan asymmetry. Uh, we don't argue in the case that it is the only metric uh, or the, the one the courts ought to rely on exclusively. Uh, we think there's a lot of benefit here in diversity. Uh, we think that you know, courts uh, can and should consider a range of related metrics. And uh, if they all point in the same direction as they do in Wisconsin, uh, that ought to give us a lot of confidence that a map is genuinely problematic, no matter how you measure its partisan unfairness. Uh, if the metrics diverge, as they will in some cases, uh, that ought to be a major red flag. So if the efficiency gap says one thing, but other metrics say something else, uh, I'd want to know a lot more about what's happening uh, before I would recommend that a court strike down that map. Uh, the second caveat is that the efficiency gap got a lot of attention in this litigation, uh, but it is far from synonymous with the plaintiff's proposed legal test. Uh, as you just made clear, the, the proposed test has three separate prongs, uh, discriminatory intent, a discriminatory effect that is both large and durable, uh, and an absence of any legitimate justification, like political geography, for example, uh, for this effect that we, that we observe. So the efficiency gap only goes to the size of the observed discriminatory effect. It doesn't tell you anything about whether there is discriminatory intent, it doesn't tell you anything about durability, and it doesn't tell you anything about whether the, uh, the large discriminatory effect 
is or is not justified. Uh, so you know, it really is a mistake to conflate the plaintiff's entire theory with this one particular metric. Uh, so I guess now that I've undermined myself, let me, let me also say what the efficiency gap is. Uh, it's meant to be an intuitive way to capture in a single number the uh, two key techniques that are used in every single partisan gerrymander ever. Uh, those two techniques are cracking and packing. So cracking refers to uh, dispersing the gerrymandered party's voters over a large number of districts where their preferred candidates lose every time. Uh, packing refers to concentrating the opposing party's voters in a small number of districts where their preferred candidates win, but they win by inefficient, overwhelming majorities. Uh, and so both cracking and packing produce what political scientists call wasted votes. Uh, these are votes that are wasted only in the specific sense that they're not contributing to the election of a candidate. Uh, so in the case of cracking, all of the votes that are cast for a losing candidate are wasted. You know, that candidate loses, those votes don't help the candidate to get elected. Uh, in the case of packing, all votes that are cast for the winning candidate above the 50% plus one that you need for victory are wasted as well. You know, the winning candidate would have won without those extra votes. Uh, so all the efficiency gap does is sum one party's total wasted votes over all of the districts in a map, subtract from that the other party's total wasted votes, and divide by the number of votes cast in the election. And so it tells you in a single number uh, which party is benefiting on net from all of the cracking and packing choices in a map, and how large is that party's advantage. Um, and what, the tells, what, the, what this tells us, incidentally, in Wisconsin, is that uh, Wisconsin's map in 2012, 2014, and 2016 had one of the very largest and most pro-Republican efficiency gaps of the last half century. Uh, it's not quite the worst map over the last 50 years, but it's something like one of the worst four or five over uh, five separate redistricting cycles. Um, and this is confirmed by multiple other measures uh, of partisan gerrymandering. Um, so we know with a high degree of confidence that the Republican advantage in Wisconsin is virtually unprecedented in its size uh, and also now in its consistency. You know, three straight elections of double-digit pro-Republican efficiency gaps. Thanks very much for that. Um, Aaron, at, I'm going to ask, of course, for your response to the uh, theory of the efficiency gap and for other measures of extreme partisan asymmetry. At the oral argument, Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, Roberts famously dismissed this as sociological gobbledygook. Congratulations, Nick, for that uh, compliment. That's my uh, former boss. That's, that's <laughs> really well done. Well, it's, with that in mind, you know, maybe ch channel him more about his concern because he, well, I'll say more about what Chief Justice Roberts said. He said, wouldn't this, uh, to the average man on the street, if courts get involved in applying this sociological gobbledygook, they would assume that the court is picking Republicans and Democrats, and that would politicize the courts and undermine the efficiency of the courts. So tell us about how the chief might be concerned about enmeshing the courts in this enterprise, but, and what's your response to, to Nick's claim that this wouldn't do that, that it would just identify the most extreme gerrymanders, but not everything else? Sure. So I, I guess I'd kind of have... Three, three main thoughts in, in response to what Nick said. I mean, I think there's conceptual problems and practical problems with the efficiency gap as a metric, and I think those prove themselves out um, in, in Wisconsin and the claims that have been made as to Wisconsin. So to kind of start with the conceptual problem, um, yeah, I, I think that there's a... a, a, a a problem with the idea of equating, of, the, of kind of the wasted vote concept and equating every vote for a particular candidate as a vote for that political party writ large. Um, because it's just not the case that every time you vote for, you know, the Republican in your district, that means you want every Republican who's running in every district throughout the state to win. I and mean, I think this last election is a pretty good example of the reality that people still can and do split their tickets among political parties. And votes are driven by a lot more than just what party is next to the name of the candidate. So 
at, the, at, at, at sort of the first step of all of this, you have to build in this assumption. And I know, you know, Nick will rightfully say that there's a lot of data to support the assumption that most voters do vote consistently across politics, but not all do. And so there's a problem from the start when you're automatically treating a vote for a candidate as an equivalent of a vote for the entire slate of, par of, of candidates that that party puts out there. Um, at, at a more kind of pragmatic level, I think one of the big problems with the efficiency gap theory and it is, is that it, in, it is inherently kind of politically biased on account of political geography as it exists right now. I mean, if, if you think about it, I think it's probably true across a great many states in this country that it's just the, 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 the reality is that Democratic voters are concentrated in large cities where candidates win by an overwhelmingly Democratic vote. And Republican voters tend to be spread out in broader geographic areas where they win comfortable margins in a lot of them, but nowhere near the majorities that you tend to see in um, high population cities. And so it is just the nature of that geography of the typical state, Wisconsin included, that you're going to have, it's go there are going to be more wasted votes for Democrats than for Republicans. And I think this illustrates itself in a, a great example to me of comparing Wisconsin with its neighboring state, Illinois. And Illinois, in the same year as Wisconsin, did what I think even the Illinois legislature would admit was like an aggressively pro-Democratic party gerrymander in the Chicago area, taking all of the kind of Democratic voters in Chicago and pushing them out to the Republican suburbs, yet that doesn't measure that that doesn't even register as a problematic gerrymander under the efficiency gap. It looks like it's not pro-Democrat in the same way, whereas I think the political realities are, you know, that it, it, it's awfully hard to say that Illinois isn't at least as bad as what you know is claimed to have happened in Wisconsin. And then I, I think you know precisely because there's both some conceptual and some practical problems in this. I mean, I, I, you know, one of the other worst maps in history is Wisconsin's own map that it was living under under a court order for the 10 years before the legislature put this map in place. So a court drawing a map with no obvious political bias behind why the court was doing what the court was doing happened to draw a map that created the same kind of pro-Republican bias over a 10-year period that's claimed here. And I guess I'll make one tiny little last point on all of that, which is, you know, this is an, an enduring over three elections, but but the Republicans have actually won a majority of the vote in two of those three elections and not that much, you know, they were pretty close in the third one. So this isn't an enduring example of a minority winning a majority. It's actually an enduring example of a majority winning a majority in the state of Wisconsin. So I think when you put all that together, I mean, it just, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting data point to add to the mix of all the social science, but I don't think it gets you over that finish line of having a theory that is, is sufficiently reliable to constitutionalize. Fascinating. Nick, you heard Aaron's great point, so please respond. But the very powerful point that I'm sure you all heard as well, the efficiency gap is politically biased. It favors uh, Democrats who tend to concentrate themselves into uh, highly populated cities and discriminates against Republicans. And Aaron says, because of that big sort, where red and blue America are just self-segregating themselves geographically, um, any way that you draw the districts may lead to partisan entrenchment. Yeah, sure. So let me just start by saying that uh, all, all of Aaron's points are not specific to the efficiency gap. Uh, if you didn't use any fancy metric whatsoever and just looked at seats and votes, you could make essentially the same argument. If you used a different social scientific metric, uh, things that I won't define, but you know, partisan bias, the mean median difference, uh, the exact same points would apply. So none of these are criticisms of the efficiency gap per se. They're criticisms of the very idea that you can quantify and measure uh, partisan unfairness uh, in, in redistricting. Uh, with respect to Aaron's first point that you know, all of these different metrics are simplifying politics by assuming that party is all there is, uh, that would have been a great point in 1975 or 1980. Uh, you know, when split ticket voting was rampant, when you had lots of uh, liberal Northeastern Republicans 
lots of conservative Southern Democrats. Uh, for better or worse, though, we're in a different era today than we were 40 years ago. Uh, levels of split ticket voting are infinitesimal. Uh, if you show me how a precinct voted in Wisconsin for uh, a presidential election, I know with 99% uh, precision how that same precinct voted in assembly races, in US House races, in uh, you know, sub-state legislative races. Uh, for better or worse, partisan, partisanship now is an unbelievably dominant driver of voter behavior uh, at different electoral levels and over time. So you know, it is certainly true that there exist split ticket voters, but they uh, pale compared to how many there were uh, one or two generations ago. Um, on the political geography point, uh, I, I would say that uh, this is a, a complicated topic where uh, you know, the, the impact of spatial patterns on any of these metrics is going to vary a lot from one state to another, from one electoral level to another. Uh, but a couple of, of important data points. Um, in Wisconsin, we know what would happen from uh, uh, a recent article uh, if one was to draw hundreds of district maps for the state legislature without considering electoral data at all. Now, if there was a real natural pro-Republican pro tilt to Wisconsin's geography, uh, we would expect those hundreds of randomly drawn maps to betray the Republican tilt, you know, to, to lean consistently in a Republican direction. Um, but they don't. Uh, they are, uh, on average, very, very close to perfectly neutral in their treatment of the parties. Uh, and the actual Wisconsin map is completely outside the distribution of the hundreds of simulated maps. So, you know, this is the best technique we have for measuring the impact of a given state's political geography. And we know that in Wisconsin, there are uh, enough super red suburban districts to offset the uh, deep blue districts in Madison or Milwaukee. Uh, we know, you know, with virtual certainty that the observed map is not the result of political geography because we never ever see a simulated map that comes anywhere close to the pro-Republican bias of the actual map. Uh, another interesting data point, so, you know, abstracting away from Wisconsin itself, over 50 years of history, uh, if you look at the distribution for the efficiency gap or for any other metric, it is a perfect bell curve centered on zero. So the historical distribution of the metric does not give you any indication that there is a persistent pro-Republican or pro-Democratic tilt. Uh, historically, by far the most common kind of map has been a perfectly fair map. Uh, and there have not been more pro-Republican uh, or, mo or more pro-Democratic maps historically. Uh, so I take that to mean that both in the case at hand, political geography is not tilted in a Republican direction, uh, and over five decades in all 50 states and over state legislative and congressional elections, uh, again, there's no persistent geographic advantage for either party. Now, are there individual states in particular time periods where geography might point in one way or another? Absolutely. Illinois may well be an example like that. You know, when you have uh, a nine million person metro area with a lot of Democrats, uh, that is a state that might have a natural pro-Republican advantage. Uh, but for every Illinois, there are lots of other cases going the other way. Uh, you know, in the Deep South, you tend to have uh, a lot of rural African Americans who vote for Democrats. And so the political geography of deep southern states tends to be pro-democratic. Uh, in other places, like North Carolina, you have uh, a, a, su a substantial number of medium-sized cities. And so each one of those medium-sized cities can anchor a congressional district. And overall, North Carolina's political geography seems to be pro-democratic. Uh, so, you know, sure, there are cases like Illinois, you know, New York, but there are lots of cases going the other way. And there is no reason to think that there is a persistent universal uh, Republican advantage when it comes to political geography. Great. Well, we now we started with the constitutional question, which is the subject of this panel. We've now turned to the more political question of whether the source of incumbents entrenchment and polarization in America 
is political gerrymandering or geographic sorting, and that's going to be the subject of the next panel, but I want to wrap up this incredibly rich discussion on the constitutional point, uh, and we have a, a tradition here of closing arguments, so, and Aaron, you've, you've just made them, and you're really good at it. The, the, clo the, the, the question basically is uh, this, why do you believe that partisan gerrymandering does not violate the First Amendment, closing arguments to persuade the audience? Sure. Well, I, I guess I, I, I think, you know, I think it's important to kind of focus on what the real question before the court is, which is, is there a way for the courts to reliably and neutrally and fairly resolve claims that there has been too much partisanship in the districting process? I mean, it's less a, it's, it's less a question of, you know, is this a constitutional good? Should, should we like partisan gerrymandering? And more a question of, to the extent this is a disease, is the cure worse than the disease? And, and I think, you know, I, I, I think our discussion today has illustrated that we're, we're, we're still a, a long ways off if we could ever get there to having anything that is truly a reliable test that will allow courts to say, I can really tell when this is the kind of you know, use of politics that goes too far, even though everybody acknowledges that at least some degree of partisan uh, decision making in the districting process is perfectly consistent with the Constitution. So really this is a case about, you know, should we draw some, should we draw a line and are courts capable of drawing a line in a way that is consistent with the idea that we're talking about constitutionalizing you know an obligation and a right here and and i think the basic problem that continues to persist in this case and has persisted in all the cases to date involving partisan gerrymandering is that there just isn't a test that makes you feel confident that the courts are doing any more than guesswork in saying this one looks like a bad one and this one looks like a good one and that is really just not the way to get the American people to have confidence in the decisions of the judiciary. Thank you so much for that. Nick, last word in this segment. To you, why do you believe that partisan gerrymandering does violate the First Amendment? Yeah, let me talk about both the manageability of our proposed test in Whitford uh, and just again go back to the democratic harm here. Uh, so on manageability, it is, you know, I, I think it's just wrong to say that courts would be guessing, courts would be at sea under our proposed test. You know, over the last week or so, I've been working to figure out uh, how many district plans uh, in effect right now in the country would potentially be suspect uh, if the, the Whitford plaintiffs were to prevail. So if you believe the argument that the test is unmanageable, the answer would be who knows? I don't know if it's 1, 10, 75, 145. I have no idea, you know, we'd have no idea how many plans are suspect. Um, nothing could be further from the truth, right? We can immediately rule out all plans that were created by divided government or by a court uh, or by a commission. Uh, in none of those cases would there be uh, the intent to benefit one party and to handicap the opposing party. Uh, we can also rule out right away all plans that have had very small levels of partisan asymmetry or erratic levels of partisan asymmetry. And you know, that, that also uh, tosses out another 20 or 30 maps around the country. Uh, they may have been designed by a single party, but they're simply not that unfair uh, or they're not durably unfair when you look at the various uh, uh, social science metrics. Uh, and if we also uh, take a look at how many maps are more skewed than we would expect given the political geography of the state, we can further narrow down the number of, uh, of, of likely candidates for litigation. Uh, so I would say having just taken a, a, a deep look at all the maps around the country, you know, there are 99 state legislative maps. There are 43 congressional maps where you have at least two districts uh, in the map. Uh, there might be 15, there might be uh, three to four great candidates for lawsuits at the state house level uh, and at the state senate level and at the congressional level. So a total of, you know, 10 or 12 great candidates. Uh, are there a few intermediate fuzzy cases? Sure. But there's you know, 10 easy wins and 120 easy losses for plaintiffs. Uh, if this isn't manageable, I don't know what is. You know, sitting here right now, I can tell you with a high degree of certainty which maps are, uh, are, are likely to be either upheld or struck down uh, under the Whitford uh, uh, trial courts uh, test at least. Um, 
Now, finally, going back to the, the harm, you know, the reason I think partisan gerrymandering has attracted a lot of attention is because it's maybe the most potent tool there is for undermining the basic point of a democracy. You know, what is the basic point of a democracy? It is a government that is responsive to the will of the people and that is reflective of the will of the people. Um, this is not just a democratic uh, point, this is also a constitutional point. You know, the Supreme Court has said over and over again that legislatures are bodies that are meant to be responsive to the public will, responsive to the preferences of the electorate. Uh, there's no tool more potent and more insidious in preventing government from being reflective to the will of the people than gerrymandering. Uh, and Wisconsin is a great example. You know, Wisconsin is a purple state. Maybe it leans a little bit blue, although you know, lately maybe it's a little bit more purely purple. And yet because of partisan gerrymandering, Republicans have a stranglehold on the legislature and are able to enact laws that are more consistent with a ruby red state than with a purple state like Wisconsin actually is. Uh, so what is the harm of partisan gerrymandering? It's not about you know, math, it's not about votes and seats being out of whack. Uh, it's about laws being passed that are not what the people of the state want. And that is what Wisconsin is undergoing right now and what a number of other states are undergoing thanks to partisan gerrymandering. The people vote in one direction, they get a legislature that does not look like what the people voted for, and they get a legislature that then passes laws that also are not what the people want. Uh, that's what partisan gerrymandering does, and a more clear democratic and constitutional offense is really hard for me to imagine. Uh, and so I'll, I'll stop there. Nick and Aaron, it is impossible to imagine two people better able to explain the arguments on both sides of this debate. Please join me in thanking Nick Stephanopoulos and Aaron Murphy. Thank you, That's superb. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. All right, well now we turn from the constitutional arguments to the political arguments. And we have another dream team of thinkers to help illuminate them. And I will introduce them to you now as they sit down. Uh, welcome. We haven't said hi yet, but so glad you're hey, here. Hey, how are you? <laughs> welcome Good to, to the see Constitution you. Center. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you have now have the great fortune to hear from, I just want to get their titles exactly right, uh, Nolan McCarty is Susan Dowd Brown, Professor of Politics and Public Affairs and Chair of the Department of Politics at Princeton University. Carolyn Fredrickson is President of the American Constitution Society for Law and Public Policy. She is also Co-Chair of the National Constitution Center's Coalition of Freedom Advisory Board and with her counterpart, Lee Otis, Head of the Federalist Society, is co-sponsoring with the Constitution Center a series of traveling debates and educational materials across America. And David Wasserman is house editor for the Cook Political Report. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Carolyn Fredrickson, Nolan McCarty, and David Wasserman. So these uh, remarkable thinkers will really help us dig down on what the political harms, if any, of gerrymandering are but before we do that, we have a great tradition in our Constitution Center debates of taking constitutional votes. And you just heard that really remarkable discussion on the first panel. I want you to take a vote, and then you'll hear this discussion, which is on a related topic, and then we'll take another vote at the end and see who, if anyone, has changed his or her minds. And as you listen to the argument, be open to the arguments on the other side. Be open to the possibility of separating your constitutional from your political views and see if your, your views change. So this is the question, is the one I asked for the closing arguments. Who believes, after hearing the arguments that you just heard, that partis partisan gerrymandering does violate the First Amendment to the US Constitution? Getting a full 360 uh, vote count here. Uh, and who believes that partisan gerrymandering does not violate the Constitution? Wow, okay, I would say a heavy majority in favor of a First Amendment violation. Listen now with an open mind to the arguments and see who changes his or her mind. This is not strictly a constitutional, but uh, also a political discussion, but as you heard from the last panel, the two questions are related. Uh, Carolyn, I wanna start with you, because you gave such a uh, strong presentation in a recent National Constitution Center Intelligence Squared debate on this question. 
What do you think the harm of partisan gerrymandering is? Well, I, you know, I, it's hard to come after um, Nick because I think he stated it so well. Um, but, I, you know, I think everybody sort of grasps that the, the partisan gerrymandering that we're seeing is, if not a cause of, is certainly correlated to the extraordinary partisanship that we see in our society. And I think the difficulty of, you know, the bodies like Congress to actually function um, the, the, the attitude of the American people now to their elected officials and the elected bodies is one of, you know, if not despair, certainly cynicism um, and dismay. Um, I think um, what we have is a system that seems so rigged to people that uh, many people decide not to participate at all. Um, and in many of these gerrymandered uh, districts, uh, they have an extraordinary um, um, fall off in terms of, I mean, they're obviously, they're not competitive. Um, and so and in many of them, the only, the only race that matters is the primary. Uh, and so people who are part of that uh, minority in that district start to feel that they don't, they shouldn't bother participating at all. So they stop voting. And people who get elected in those gerrymandered districts don't have to attend to the interests of those voters. Um, and so that I think it turns into, you know, the situation um, that we heard about in Wisconsin, where you have a legislature that's not responsive to the voters um, because they come out of such secure districts. They have such little likelihood of losing uh, unless they lose in their primary. And that pushes them to the extremes. Um, and as a result, they, they, they push for legislative uh, proposals that are on the extreme so that they can win their primaries. And I think that just in, continues to exacerbate the overall cynicism um, and dismay that people have with our government and then uh, leads to even more fall off in democratic participation. I think as uh, you know, we should all be extraordinarily concerned with the, with the harm that that does to our democracy uh, as a whole, uh, because it then seems to be only a, a democracy in name, but not actually in practice. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Nolan, in a debate last year in Washington, you took uh, a different perspective to this question. Uh, Carolyn just argued that partisan gerrymandering is responsible for political polarization, as safe seats mean that low voter turnout, voters can choose extreme candidates who have no incentive to go to the middle of the general election. You disagree and believe that p partisan gerrymandering is not responsible for political polarization. Tell us why. Okay, let me, let me back up one step on gerrymandering. It was actually defined at the beginning of tonight's session as being a partisan activity. There are lots of ways in which you can gerrymander that are not necessarily partisan. You can do a bipartisan gerrymander, which both parties collude to make as seats as safe as possible. Or you can partisan gerrymander. Those two things have very different features. Uh, the first, the bipartisan gerrymander, uh, describes a situation very much like Carolyn suggests, where there's lack of competition in any seat because they've been designed to be Democratic seats and Republican seats. But when we talk about partisan gerrymandering, the strategy for a majority party is quite different. What they would like to do is to concentrate the voters of the other party into a few seats, spread their voters out over a very large number of seats. So the ironic thing is that partisan gerrymandering actually creates more competitive seats, closer elections uh, than, its bipart than its bipartisan alternative. So there's, there's a theoretical issue in linking political polarization to partisan gerrymandering. It could be related to bipartisan gerrymandering, but we're in a world in which bipartisanship doesn't happen. So we have this, we have this paradox. Um, I've spent a lot of time just empirically, so that's the theoretical argument. I've spent a lot of time on this empirically. There's a few things worth noting empirically. Now, the first is that we observe polarization in the United States Senate and it tracks the polarization in the US House almost perfectly over time. Maybe the level's not as high, but there are other reasons to explain differences in levels, but the trends are the same. If we look at states that have one congressional district or two congressional districts, places where we don't expect gerrymandering to play much of a role, we see those members being more and more extreme over time. We also don't see measures of polarization in terms of the voting behavior of members of Congress jump at reapportionment. And then finally, there's some advanced statistical work that asks the question, suppose we uh, 
artificially, randomly generated districts, what would polarization look like in the United States? It looks almost like the same that we have now. What's really happened to American politics over the course of time is that Democrats and Republicans have just gotten different over time. They have different constituencies, they have different policy priorities, and those tend to be reflected independently of how they're elected or what types of districts that, 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 that they come from. So my argument is always that, yes, we, we can be concerned about g gerrymandering, in particular the impressions that gerrymandering creates with the public, but if we really want to understand partisan polarization, why Democrats and Republicans are different, we have to look at bigger, broader trends in our society, less on the kind of fine details of how districts are drawn. And just one more beat, because that's part of your argument. What are those bigger, broader trends that you believe are responsible for political polarization, aside from partisan gerrymandering? When we talk about political polarization, the main trends, especially when we're talking about it at the kind of congressional level, which is the, our focus here, or state legislatures, is that the United States is a much more heterogeneous society. Uh, it's economically, there's high, increased economic inequality, it's increased diversity ethnically, and so forth. We have seen broad regional realignments in the country so that we've seen the South become considerably more Republican and the Northeast become considerably more Democratic. Uh, apropos to tonight's discussion, we've seen uh, cities become much more uh, uniformly uh, democratic, much more of a concentration of democratic voters. So it's these combination of realignments and kind of uh, changes to the kind of underlying social structure of the United States, which I think are more important than how districts are drawn. Thank you so much for that. All right, uh, David, uh, Justice Wasserman, I should say, you can now adjudicate between these two very strong I'm not even views. a lawyer, don't promote well, me. You're here at the <laughs> National Health Care Center, so I appreciate your commission. Um, I, I have a sense of what you uh, believe, because you wrote a piece for uh, f the 538 blog in 2016, uh, trying to answer Nate Silver's question, why is compromise so hard in the House? And you gave five answers, geographic sorting. Wait, I need my bipartisan constitutional reading glasses. For <laughs> uh, geographic sorting, straight ticket voting, primaries have become the new general elections, uh, and uh, the, those are the main ones. Um, to tell the audience what you believe is the, course, the cause of uh, political polarization that's made compromise so hard in the House. Is it partisan gerrymandering, or is it some other factors? Well, it's not an either-or argument. I don't see it that way, because uh, self-sorting and gerrymandering work together to produce polarization. And Professor McCarty is absolutely right. The biggest trend we've seen in the past several decades is actually the self-sorting of the American electorate. We've measured at the Cook Political Report, uh, we have our Partisan Voter Index, or PVI, that measures the partisanship of all 435 congressional districts. What we've found is that in 1997, 164 out of 435 districts were fundamentally competitive. That number has fallen 56% in the last 20 years to just 72 out of 435. And actually, we only rated 15 out of 435 House races as toss-ups last year. So we knew who was going to win in over 95% of the elections. But what we also found was that 83% of that decline was driven by self-sorting of voters themselves from election to election. Only 17% of that decline was att attributable to redistricting years. And just to give you an idea of how badly segregated the American voting population has become by party, I conducted a study about six years ago on which two retail chains were the best predictors of where Democrats and Republicans live and vote. <laughs> and the top indexing chain for Democrats, no surprise, Whole Foods Market. The top indexing chain for Republicans, Cracker Barrel Old Country Store. Wow. <laughs> Pennsylvania has a few of, of each. Yes, we do. But, and actually, Pennsylvania has the closest point between a Cracker Barrel and a Whole Foods in Plymouth <laughs> Meeting. No joke. But, That's a great mall, actually. But yes. in 1992, Bill Clinton, when he won the White House, won 59% of counties that today have a Whole Foods and 40% of counties that today have a Cracker Barrel. That was a 19-point gap. It's gone up every election until 2016, when Donald Trump won the White House, winning 76% of counties with a Cracker Barrel and 22% of counties with a Whole Foods. Now, I was going over these statistics yeah. with a group of young Democratic professionals a couple years before this last election. And I actually, uh, just as an aside, there was a young woman in the audience who raised her hand. She said, excuse me, did you mean Crate and Barrel? I've never <laughs> heard of Cracker Barrel. <laughs> and that just gives you an idea 
of uh, the bubble a lot of Democratic <laughs> voters live in. But that's the main driver here. Wow. I have to ask the obvious question. Is the whole metric going to be messed up now that Amazon has bought Whole Foods? <laughs> <laughs> ask me in five years. Okay, good. Okay, Carolyn, so this is... Um, I, the audience has heard the argument about whether partisan gerrymandering or geographic sorting is more responsible for polarization, and uh, David said it's a mix of both. But let's address this geographic sorting question, because it sounds like even if uh, Nick Stephanopoulos' efficiency gap standard is adopted, even if the Supreme Court strikes down the Wisconsin district, he said that's something like 10 out of 122 districts. It's not going to be that many that will fall. What will the remaining effect of this big sort be for progressives who are concentrated in big cities and unable to win uh, state legislative elections that are uh, defined geographically by single member districts? Well, I mean, as I said when I started, it's, it's a correlation, it's not a causation. Um, but 17% is actually a really big number. If you look at how the House uh, of Representatives is divided, 17% would have an enormous impact on, on the composition of that body. And particularly as we're looking to the next election cycle, um, the possibility of, of control uh, flipping is, you know, is, is, is always a possible. Um, but post redistricting after uh, districts were reconfigured in light of uh, uh, data that actually tried to um, make districts that were uh, more fair you'd actually have a very tightly contested House of Representatives. Um, and you wouldn't have you know, the situation now where the Democrats uh, in the last cycle won 1.4 million votes, I think that was the number, more than Republicans, and yet fell far short of their representation in the House. So I think, I mean, I think if we care about democracy, that's an enormous number. That's not a small number. It may be that more of the the difference is attributable to people self-sorting, but I don't think when the control of government is determined by that 17% that we can think that that's inconsequential. It's, it's extraordinarily consequential, and that 17% is based on um, maps that are drawn to give an extraordinary advantage to one party, and I'd have to say in this case, to the Republican Party, because uh, I think experts like your colleague Sam Wang at Princeton have shown that the Republican drawn maps are, have done, and Republicans have done this in a much uh, greater uh, number of times. And I think after the red map program um, that uh, Karl Rove ran in 2010 uh, to capture as many state houses as possible, the whole objective was to get ahead of the redistricting process to flip those state houses and then write those maps and lock in for the long term. And uh, the Republican state leadership committee, which um, ran these uh, elections, bragged about it after the election, how with a minority of votes, how they were able to capture a, f a large majority of the seats. I think that is very troubling. N Nolan, uh, do you agree or disagree with Carolyn? If the Supreme Court were to strike down extreme partisan gerrymanders, would that make districts more competitive and minimize the situations where a party can win a minority of votes but get a majority of the seats? Uh, so let me just uh, semi-correct one thing. I think Professor Stefanovic said that 17% of maps would be judiciable, not that 17% of seats would change. And so my guess is, based on what I've seen, there would be a, a far fewer, fewer changes uh, once, those, once, those cases, once those cases went forward. Um, I, guess I'm not, I guess I'm not sure the question. I mean, once you take away the partisan option in gerrymandering, what, what replaces it? Uh, so the Supreme Court's not going to insist that states use commissions or do it anyway. It's just going to be a matter of saying what's going to be the effect of eliminating partisan considerations from districting. So there's, there's two possibilities which might work in opposing ways. One is that because of issues like geographic sorting, where Democratic voters are concentrated into cities, it's actually the case that I think Democratic map makers need to be able to use partisanship to justify, to justify un, unpacking these urban, these urban voters. So it could put constraints on the Democratic Party's attempts to offset these effects of geographic sorting. The other is they might fall back into the bipartisan gerrymandering, which I talked about, where simply the parties disagree. Well, if we can't do partisan gerrymandering, let's just all make all of our districts safe. 
And so we'd have, very, we'd have even fewer competitive districts. There'd be perhaps more proportionality, but we would be a situation where there's completely Democratic districts, completely Republican districts, because you haven't incentivized parties to try to be aggressive in picking up these more, these more marginal seats. So, you know, because I'm a social scientist, I have three hands, and I'm going to use all three hands on them. So I, I don't know what the impact is going to be, because one thing we know about the, the social sciences is that there are always unintended consequences. And I think the intervention of the courts in a much more explicit way is ripe for these unintended consequences. And since they're unintended, I actually don't know what they're going to be. So uh, <laughs> um, uh, thanks for your candor. That's <laughs> admirable. Uh, David, so there's now this dispute about what the effect of a Supreme Court decision would be, but I know you caught all of our attention with that remarkable Whole Foods and Cracker Barrel analogy, which just shows how powerfully Red and Blue America are living in different universes, both physically and virtually. Tell us more about how that geographic sorting, along with the other factors you mentioned about straight ticket voting and, and primaries determining the general, has really caused polarization in Congress. And then I'm just going to ask you such a hard follow-up, which is what, if anything, could be done about it? Sure. Well, it was said earlier that technology has allowed the gerrymandering uh, uh, you know, epidemic to run wild. And actually, what's allowed gerrymandering to be as, as powerful as a tool as it is, and I agree that it's a big, big problem, um, is actually the self-sorting of the American electorate. If you imagine a state where every precinct voted the exact same way, it would be possible, impossible to manipulate the boundaries in such a way as to give one party an advantage over the other. But now let's imagine a really, really polarized state, which Pennsylvania has become, most other states have become, between urban and rural areas. It's easier than ever before for the map maker to manipulate the boundaries to, uh, to win a higher share of seats. So I'm convinced it is a big, big problem, and that in the next cycle, if gone unchecked, the parties could virtually eliminate competitive congressional elections. I'm just not convinced, and I salute Nick and Eric McGee for devising this, this metric, I'm not convinced that it's workable as a legal standard. And I would, in fact, suggest that this is a problem not necessarily for pundits or political scientists, but a problem for mathematicians and computer scientists to solve. If, what if instead of looking at partisan data and racial data, we simply devised a computer algorithm to draw the shortest possible line to divide states into equal populous districts? I think technology can be part of the solution, not the problem. Um, thanks for that hopeful that moment of hope. That's uh, excellent. Uh, Carolyn, other, other solutions. The court will or will not intervene. We're debating about what the effects will be, but it sounds like the problem is very serious and the geographic sorting is a big part of it. What are other solutions to the problem of uh, partisan entrenchment where one party can entrench itself for decades to come and to polarization? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, in some states, voters have taken uh, law into their own hands and passed uh, ballot initiatives where they have set up nonpartisan uh, commissions to actually undertake the process. Uh, California was one of them, and I understand that the Democrats were very unhappy about that at the time, um, worried about what it would do to their incumbency. Um, but they ga you know, gathered a, a, a nonpartisan group of people that um, worked um, to rewrite those districts. Other states have done the same thing. Um, and in some cases, it hasn't changed the composition of the, uh, of the electeds very much because they were somewhat reflective of what the population wanted. Um, but what it gave was an extraordinary a boost to people's confidence that the people they were voting for were actually representing them and cared about listening to them. Um, and so that's one mechanism that I think in certain places will certainly change the composition of the electeds because they will have to respond to a, a different electorate. They won't, you know, the, the, the common phrase is that, you know, under the current system that the elected officials get to choose their voters rather than voters choosing the elected officials. Well, the point of a nonpartisan commission would be to draw districts where the people were actually choosing who would serve them in the elected body. And I think that is one um, mechanism that could go a long way towards addressing both sort of the overall impact on people's faith in the system as well as the system. Uh, Nolan, what solutions do you think could make legislatures more 
uh, responsive and representative and could uh, reduce polarization? Um, so uh, I'm not very good with uh, solutions. I mean, if, if, I, if I predicate my remarks on that the American society is much more you know, heterogeneous uh, and that people are choosing to live with people with similar preferences, there's not a lot of policies that I can do to make us more homogeneous and to force people not to live where they want, where, where they want to live. Um, on the gerrymandering solutions, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of the technological solutions because one of the things I worry about is there are a lot of values that undergird districting. I mean, the districting is sort of the way in which we sort of shape people's political identities. I worry a little bit about the focus on partisan gerrymandering being that the only political identity that matters is partisanship. So there's a lot of districting principles like maintaining communities of interest, uh, ensuring that uh, racial and ethnic minorities have opportunities to elect candidates, uh, candidates of their choice, uh, you know, et cetera. So I worry about whether or not just the technocratic solution to these kind of fundamental uh, va values uh, trade-offs. On polarization, I think, you know, I would put much more emphasis on trying to understand what's gone wrong in the campaign finance system. Uh, the amount of spending, especially by very, very wealthy people, has had a really important impact. For, for a long time, political scientists sort of doubted that this was going on, but the more recent data just really suggest that, uh, uh, that, that the advanced uh, activities of the wealthy and the political process have had big effects. So let me give you one data point. In 1980, uh, the top 10,000 donors, very wealthy people, uh, gave about 8% of the total contributions to American federal elections. Now that number is 45%. And so I really think again, that, you know, if we want to really concentrate on the fundamental sources of political dysfunction in the U.S., it's the, it's the inequalities in participation fostered by our campaign contribution system that's far more important uh, than the district boundaries. Just so we understand, um, how does the uh, electoral dysfunction of uh, campaign finance contribute to polarization? Well, one of the things that's... Uh, in the old campaign finance system, where we worried a lot about what corporations and labor unions were doing, there was kind of a countervailing, there was kind of a countervailing effect in that uh, corporations wanted to get access from both sides of the aisle, so their contributions were not particularly partisan. La labor unions... Uh, tended toward the Democrats, but they were very pragmatic. What we've seen is an explosion of individual contributions, primarily by people with more ideological agendas, both on the right uh, and on the left. And my argument is simply that the voice of these more ideological individual contributors uh, is being heard uh, much more, and that it makes it very much harder for people who are both dependent on campaign contributions from these individuals, but also worried about the independent expenditures that these individuals can bring into their districts, especially in primaries, that has a much bigger impact on their behavior in legislatures uh, than the composition of their districts because the voters' voices are, in any type of district are being drowned out by the donors' voices. Very interesting. David, would you agree or disagree that this uh, role of money in politics, which uh, no one says means that uh, big donors on the left and the right who are extremely ideological can pull both parties to the extreme left and the right is a source of polarization. And what, if anything, can be done about that? Well, I think the mistake we often make, again, is, is that we treat these as independent effects, uh, when in fact we have a lot of comorbidities in American politics, yeah. right? <laughs> nice. And when we think about the way districts are drawn, it amplifies the, the sorting that we've already had, which in turn means that if there are very few competitive seats by the time we get to November, then primary elections, as Caroline said, have essentially become the new general elections. And in fact, in 90% of districts, I think, uh, in a neutral political environment at least, the primary election is tantamount to the general election. We've seen that increasingly in House races. And th what that means Guess how many voters actually turned out to vote in, in congressional primaries the last time we had a midterm election? 14.6%. That means that 7% of the people on the farthest left end of the spectrum and 7% of the people on the farthest right end of the spectrum are essentially electing more than 90% of members of Congress. And in turn, what that means is that it's easier than ever for very wealthy individuals 
or, uh, or people who can raise a lot of money from very ideological sources to capture a primary in which a, only a small handful of voters participate. So that's how all these factors are working together to incentivize extremism and disincentivize cooperation. Wow. So this conversation is moving broadly, but this is directly relevant to uh, many of our concerns here. Carolyn, you are co-chair, along with Lee Otis of the Federalist Society of the National Constitution Center's Madisonian Constitution for All Commission. We are uniting uh, senators and representatives from both parties, including Mike Lee and Chris Coons, to ask, what would James Madison think of our current Congress, presidency, courts, and media, and how can we resurrect Madisonian values of thoughtful deliberation and enlightened representation today, we have on the table this possibility that direct primaries are one dysfunction that are polarizing Congress in a way that is making deliberation impossible. One of the last great opponents of the direct primary was my uh, new hero, William Howard Taft, <laughs> the subject of my next book. Should we get rid of the direct primaries and is a good alternative the California solution of open primaries where the top two vote getters then go to a runoff and uh, both parties can run? Uh, you know, I think we should be trying different approaches, and that has certainly um, seemed to stimulate, again, some greater engagement um, uh, among the population. Um, you know, in speaking of Madison, I think, you know, he, he was one who really believed that the House was going to be the body that was going to turn over regularly and how important that was. So to your point, um, if, I, if you don't mind me going back to the money and politics piece, I think why they're so related is that a lot of those same donors, and I completely agree with you that the, that the money in politics is a big factor in the polarization, those same donors are funding the redistricting efforts. Um, they're the ones you know, who are funding these state uh, efforts to, to capture a few seats in a state house to flip it and then develop maps. So there's a very close alignment between the interests of those, of those partisan funders um, uh, in both influencing the maps and then influencing what the members do when they get elected. Um, so I think these things are quite, are quite joined. But, you know, I think we should be looking at open primaries. Um, I, I, you know, I think there's, there's got to be a better way than the way we're doing it. What uh, 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 we talked earlier about uh, uh, the proportional representation. Um, Maine has been, um, has a proposal to move to multi-member districts. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's been held up by the courts, but, um, but will go into effect in 2020. Um, it'll be really interesting to see what happens out of that and whether people start to feel like my vote's counting and so therefore I'm going to vote. Um, if you're one of those people in a district where uh, you're not one of the majority and there's a primary and there's, you're, me, most of these races don't even field somebody from the other party if there's such a lock um, on the, the, the majority party in that district, there's not even a candidate to vote for. People are definitely not turning out. Um, and I think we, you know, as a society, need to grapple with what, how we envision democracy. Um, and when we have these kind of numbers of participation, you know, it's, it's very troubling. N Nolan, might uh, solutions like multi-member districts work is one of the sources of this problem that 1842 law where Congress said that congressional elections have to have single-member districts, should that be reconsidered? Uh, what are other solutions? And in the course of uh, you know, answering, you had a very stark solution, which really got everyone's attention during the last debate about how extreme polarization is now. Maybe you could share it, that and tell us whether it's so extreme that even these solutions aren't going well. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not going to remember the anecdote. You might have to give me a, a better hint. Uh, I'll just say civil war. Which civil is, war, yeah, civil, yeah. yeah. I, I, one That's of the, the things that I've done uh, in my career is uh, develop and techniques of measuring political polarization. And uh, so we have a, a technique which measures political polarization in the US House and the Senate uh, using roll call votes. And so we're able to go back for very long periods of time. And uh, the levels of polarization that we see today sort of rival those that we saw during Reconstruction. So if you imagine a situation in which country just fought a civil war and one party thought the other party was composed of traitors, you'd have a pretty good picture of what our current political system looks like. So I, I'm, not under, I'm not dismissing polarization as, a, as an important phenomenon. Um, in theory, uh, multi-member districting done the right way might address uh, some of these problems. Um, so take, take an example, just say instead of having 20 districts, you had 10 two-member districts. 
Well, that's half as much gerrymandering, so if you're concerned about district boundaries, it's, it's 10 fewer districts as you have to draw. And it also gets around my problem of having the map designers design, uh, define political communities, because if you can build coalitions within districts to support one or the other of the two candidates, uh, you know, representation can, uh, of different types of political interests can, uh, can evolve kind of naturally in that setting. Now you have to do it correctly. New Jersey, my, my home state, does it incorrectly. Uh, they, they do have two member districts, but every voter gets two votes. And so it still is a very majoritarian system in that all the Democratic voters cast two votes for Democrats and the Republicans cast their two votes for Republicans. So it doesn't quite get to these features uh, uh, that, that I'm trying to stress. Let me just add, add one thing to the, the, the previous set of comments about the lack of competition in, in congressional elections and its implications for primaries and money. I, I, I totally agree with all that. But I think there's one thing that's really worth remembering. There was a graphic that went around social media a couple of weeks ago that showed the distribution of presidential voting across congressional districts in the U.S. House and, what, and also showed it across states. And people were just retweeting this like mad because it's like, look at how much more variation there is in presidential voting outcomes across congressional districts. But the truth is, it was much more significant at the state level. It was really the states that had become much more bimodal in terms of their partisan support. So a lot of these pernicious features we talk about in these House elections, that all the competition takes place you know, in the primaries, there's very little competition uh, it, you know, in, in House elections. It's all true of the Senate without redistricting. I mean, we're gonna go into, we're going to go into a situation in 2018 where the Republicans have a bare majority of a bare majority of senators. They're going in with a very unpopular president. Yet most people think it's the House that's in play and not the Senate because states are just as bad, if not worse, than House districts at that point. And that doesn't really have anything to do with with, with gerrymandering. One other point on this is that. You know, uh, back in you know November, November 2016, we all remember uh, the Democratic candidate for president got three million more votes than the Republican candidate, yet lost the Electoral College very badly. That's totally because of the geographic sorting of, of voters, and that in states that are heavily urban, Hillary Clinton ran up big vote totals, and in states that were less urban, uh, Donald Trump won narrow victories. That's the kind of gerrymandering story in a nutshell, yet it was all done at the state level as part of electoral college. It's not a defense of electoral college, not to justify that outcome, but just to say that some of the phenomena that we've been talking about that are dysfunctional by American politics are deeper than the, just the simple drawing of district boundaries. David, uh, last question and then closing statements. In, in your piece, you say that uh, our legislative process is not designed to withstand the current levels of partisan polarization in the America and the fear that the process is rigged is uh, an existential threat. So how, how serious is this problem of polarization? And if you had to pick one solution, what would it be? Well, actually, the title of the article was The American Political System Isn't Rigged. It's even worse than that. Uh, because if it were rigged, we could arrest the riggers and get on with it, right? Uh, but in fact, what, what we're seeing is a, a confluence of, of these factors. You know, I, I, I don't uh, necessarily prescribe one as, as the answer, but, uh, and as a proud New Jerseyan who grew up right, right across the river from here, I, I hate to say that California is a model for reform for the country, but I have to say, I think the top two primary system has potential. Uh, as a moderating force uh, for, uh, for the way we elect members of Congress. If we think about a member of Congress who's faced with a tough vote, um, where if they go against their party's interest, they'd lose their next primary, then the top two system provides them with an avenue to win re-election. They don't need to necessarily win uh, the most votes in the first round in a closed primary of, of just their party. Uh, they can advance to the general election where it's perhaps a Republican versus a Republican. And the party that is not represented on the ballot can choose the more moderate of those two or the vice versa with Democrats. So I do think it has uh, potential. And I think we also need to, to, need to keep in mind uh, that uh, 
you know, multi, multi-member districts, uh, you know, have, have some potential as well. I'm not exactly sure how, how that would be imposed, but I'm, I'm open to it. So like all great conversations, this one has been really wide ranging and we started with polarization and we've now concluded that the problem, the Madisonian problem, namely that legislatures are responsive to extremes rather than to the uh, majority of the people is worse than we thought, may be responsible uh, for uh, partisan gerrymandering, but also has other factors, including money in politics, direct primaries, low voter turnout. We've identified some solutions from multi-member districts to open primaries, but now we have to return to the debate subject. And I'm just for closing statements, because the audience has to vote again, I know this has been more of a political uh, but a, uh, than a constitutional discussion, but the two are uh, related. So the question is going to be this, and uh, first word is to you, Carolyn. Uh, what is the harm of partisan gerrymandering, and does it violate the Constitution? Well, you know, I think the partisan gerrymandering clearly um, uh, contributes. It may not be the cause or the sole cause of polarization, but it clearly contributes to it. Um, on the harm, um, there are these uh, the, the question of associational rights and of, of people's ability to have representation that is responsive to them. That's both the harm in a constitutional sense. It's also the harm um, in a societal sense in, in sort of what binds us together as a democracy, uh, this belief that our government um, is responsive to the voters and not responsive to the elected officials who then choose their voters so they can get the outcomes they want. Um, there's a the clear polarization in American society, it's not going to be solved completely um, by having a better system, a fairer system of redistricting, but it will be somewhat mitigated. Uh, and I think uh, we owe it to our democracy to try. Thank you very much for that. Nolan, what is the harm of partisan gerrymandering and does it violate the Constitution? Uh, so I'm not an attorney, so I have a little bit of a difficulty with the constitutional question. Uh, let, me deal with, let me deal with the harm. Uh, uh, I actually think that the harms are far less considerable than most people suggest. As I suggested, uh, I think the worst form of gerrymandering would be a bipartisan form that just simply reified existing boundaries and created no opportunities for any political contestation whatsoever. The extent to which partisan gerrymandering, while imperfect in a variety of ways, at least incentivizes parties to try to go after that marginal competitive district to spread their voters more, more over a wider part of the state than they otherwise would, uh, perhaps create some opportunities, imperfect opportunities, but some opportunities uh, for, uh, for competitive elections. One of the things that drives some of the measures of uh, partisan bias such as efficiency gap is, is in fact just that, that the party that's slightly larger is creating less safe districts for itself. And if it gets, if it gets lucky, then there's going to be a big efficiency gap. If it gets unlucky, it could lose a lot of seats and the efficiency gap would flip in the other direction. And so I think we have to be careful about ruling out partisan gerrymandering because I think it's probably the only source that gives politicians incentives to try to create districts that are at all competitive uh, in, a, in, a part, in a partisan sense. Um, and I also think if you're, you know, you're concerned about the kind of pernicious effects of uh, political geography, the concentration of urban voters, I think partisan gerrymandering might be a tool uh, that can be used to offset that, taking partisanship into consideration when trying to uh, you know, unpack uh, the cities, and so taking that off the table might, uh, you, you know, might lead to lack of opportunities to create some competition in that direction. Thank you so much for that. David, last word to you. What is the harm of partisan gerrymandering, and if you like, does it violate the Constitution? Well, I think the Democrats are at a geographic disadvantage at all levels, right? And I think it's because of the geography of the electorate. They're clustered in cities, which means that they're underrepresented in the districts that are at the fulcrum of control of the House. They're clustering in big states like California and New York where additional Democratic votes don't win them any additional electoral votes. And they're also, uh, in, in terms of the Senate, are underrepresented because rural, more Republican states account for, for a disproportionate share of the Senate. So unless Democrats really grapple with that, they're not going to address uh, 
uh, what's ailing them in the electorate today. And I think a resettlement program would actually be more beneficial for <laughs> Democrats than redistricting reform. Uh, but look, I do agree that, that there is harm in redistricting. How you go about identifying that harm, I think, is problematic. When, uh, when Nick said earlier that there would be 10 good candidates uh, of maps to overturn with the efficiency gap, my reaction is, that's not enough. I see gerrymanders all over the place that are clear uh, manipulations of, of the map for, for partisan gain. Uh, but in wave elections, like one that we might see in 2018, you also have redistrictings that can backfire. Here in Pennsylvania, Republicans stretched their advantage across the Philadelphia suburbs it, really thin across three districts. And even though each of those three seats, the 6th, 7th, and 8th, each lean towards Republicans, you could see all three of them fall to Democrats in a wave. So in that sense, uh, Professor McCarty's right. The, the thing that we'd have to fear most is probably a bipartisan gerrymander. We're going to take our final vote in a moment. But first, please join me in thanking our panelists. Wow, this has just been an extraordinarily educational discussion. I have learned so much, and I know you have too, about the complexity of this crucial question and the need to approach it from all angles. I'm thrilled to report that over the next three years, through this Madisonian Constitution Commission that Carolyn and Leotis and our senators and representatives are chairing, we're gonna have panels, symposia, podcasts, discussions here in Philadelphia and around the country through our partnership with the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society to dig into each of these questions. What would Madison think of our current Congress, presidency, courts, and media, and how can we resurrect Madisonian values today. And that's why I'm going to put in the plug one more time. I need you to join the National Constitution Center. If you are not members, we need your support, we need your engagement, and we need your passion for constitutional education so that you can spread the light to others. Um, finally, before we take our vote, thanks to the great generosity of John and Joan, we're about to have an amazing reception up on the second floor with excellent food and drink, and it is free and open to all, and I strongly suggest you go up and enjoy it because it's going to be excellent. Uh, conversation and excellent refreshments. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for our vote. You've listened hard to the discussion. You've done it with an open mind. So I want you, once again, separating your, your political from your constitutional views to tell me who believes, after hearing the arguments, that partisan gerrymandering violates the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> I can just, I'm going to make myself dizzy turning around. And who believes that it does not violate the First Amendment to the Constitution? And who changed, his, who changed his or her vote after hearing the remarkable discussion tonight? We have one possibility. Uh, wonderful. Uh, great. And uh, whose mind was open to the arguments on the other side? Wonderful. Well, that is what we're striving to achieve with our constitutional education efforts. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, John and Joan. See you upstairs. <laughs>